All right, we're part. We're in the uh, middle now of the Be the Church Challenge, and this is a challenge that we committed to do together as a church. And, and I pray that you're leaning into this. You know, in everything about spiritual growth, you can know stuff for a very long time and not take any steps with the Lord. To to grow is to lean into into relationship to God. To say, I'm going to go somewhere I haven't been before in relationship to God. I'm going to take a step I haven't stepped before with God. In the Bible, remember this. The church, when we talk about the church or the church family, it's about more than me. It's about more than mine. It's about more than what I like or what works for me. Or about, even about my class and my friends at church. The church is about all of us together. And this is what I would love to see happen in Be the Church. Like, I'm an empty nester, but I'm heavily invested and I care deeply about what happens in this building right out here with preschoolers and with children. And I'm really all in on what happens to the young adults over there in B building. But I'm all in on the adults that are a little bit older than me, and it's, it's getting harder to find that group of people, but there are some. They're right over here in building E. I care deeply about what's happening over there because I love, I love the church, not just my bite of it. And I want us to grow to be a church that cares about the whole family. And that's why we're doing this together. The objective of this 30-day church challenge, be the church, is to discover have a better understanding, and then to engage. And again, without the engagement, we're going to fall flat. But to discover and engage in the core devotions of the church as demonstrated in the first church, the church in Acts chapter 2. And we want to change how we think about church. The church is not just a place that you, you come to. It's a family you belong to. A vibrant family. A community of faith. Touching our community, touching our world with the gospel, the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what a church is, and that's for more than just 30 days of church challenge. That's, uh, that's what we want to become and grow to be. Now, two weeks ago, I shared with you about community, and I talked about the importance of being a part of a community of faith where you're, you're personally experiencing love and encouragement and support. But what we said about community is, it's not just, okay, what am I experiencing? What am I getting? But are you a contributor to the effort? Are you sharing love and support and help, encouragement to other people? Because community doesn't happen just as an intake. Inhale, there's an exhale too. There is, a, there is an effort that comes from us to be a part of community. The challenge was to, first of all, join an intentional small group, a Bible fellowship group, where you could experience genuine community because it gets to be a smaller group than this. Last week, we discussed that we're wired for worship, and we, we discovered that according to Romans chapter 12, verse 1, worship is, is not an event on a calendar, on a weekly calendar, but worship is a verb. Worship is something that we do. And it touches all aspects of our lives through the week and on Sundays. The challenge was to commit to coming to a weekly worship service. And what we found is that when we come to this time, the reason God designed it, that once a week we're going to get together, is that it resets our spiritual clock, our hearts and our minds, to say this is what's important and these are the things that are not. And if you miss that, especially if you miss it multiple times, you're going to find that you're becoming more and more distanced from God and the things of God, from the things that are eternal, the things that matter. In uh, the passage, we talked about it from uh, the message paraphrase of that verse, Romans 12. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and give it to God as an act of worship. Today, we're going to learn our challenge for this week. This relates to the third core devotion of a believer and of a church, and that is spiritual growth. So we have been following this through the book of Acts. I want to encourage you to open a Bible. If you don't have uh, your, your book Bible, your electronic Bible, there are few Bibles, and you can open up to Acts chapter 2. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then Acts, the history book of the New Testament. If you get to Romans, you've overshot your target. While you're making your way to Acts 2, three weeks from today, well, we're not going to stop having church at the end of these five weeks, just so you know. 
So three weeks from today, uh, we're going to begin a new series, and uh, Jimmy Smith and I are going to divide this one up and focus on some things. We're calling it Greater Than, and it, it's, it's, I'm excited about it because, because often we feel overwhelmed. We feel outgunned in this world. We feel like uh, we're, we're, we're in a non-impactful minority in a culture that has, has really turned from God in so many ways. And, and then we're just going through life and all the challenges of life. And what we're going to talk about is you know, no matter what you, what you fear, no matter what you, what you face, no matter, God, God's going to be greater than that. God's going to be a whole lot bigger than that. And we're going to look at some examples and we're going to walk through some of the things that, that we feel like are overwhelming to us. That No, God is greater than that. Now, Acts 2, verse 42. This is a summary of what the church looked like when the church was getting it right. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, the first church was committed to authentic community. Verse 44, they had everything in common. They're doing life together. They knew how to worship. Verse 47 says they were praising God, enjoying favor with all the people. But they had another important habit that they had adopted that was a part of their day-to-day, week-to-week. Whether it was in the big gatherings or the small gatherings, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, why did they do that? And the reason they did that is because they wanted to grow. Today, we're talking about spiritual growth. Uh, how many of you grew up with, uh, with some sort of marker on, a, on the inside of a door frame? Uh, piece of paper you hung on the wall that measured how much you'd grown. And so you do that with your, any of you do that with your children, where you just measure, okay, here's how, from this point to this point, here's how much they've grown, maybe birthday to birthday, or different holidays. I remember, I remember how great it was to be growing. And I remember the day that, that I could jump up and I could hit the door facing, the, you know, the top of the, top of the door as, as a boy. It's one of those boy things. I remember when my mother taught me how to clean a door facing. Uh, that was also a part of that growing up process. I remember the first time all our family lived in Arkansas, and I remember going back to Arkansas that first time, and uh, I was taller than Grandma Self, which wasn't a real stretch. She was about 5'2", but still, I'd pass my grandmother. And I remember when I was, got to be taller than Mom. Remember when I got to be a couple inches taller than my dad? And we celebrate growth uh, along the way. And growth is a part of who we are as humans. The Bible also values growth. And the Bible measures our spiritual growth. John, what I'm about to read to you from 1 John. John wrote this. He was probably in his 70s at the time. Which for that day in the first century, that's a really, he was way up there in years. And so he's writing as a spiritual elder to, to younger believers. And this is what he writes. I'm writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his namesake. And I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you've overcome the evil one. I write to you children because you know the father. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the evil one. So here's John's definition. I'll take, take all that. and He does it back and forth, back and forth between these three groups of people. But he's talking about spiritual growth and about markers of spiritual growth. Spiritual children. Spiritual children are those who've received Christ as their Savior. They've come to that place. I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And they've made a commitment of their life to Christ. Their sins have been forgiven. And they are beginning to know God. 
He talks about spiritual young men as a way to, way to block this as another group. And they're strong. And they're getting stronger. And they're getting bigger. And the reason they're getting bigger is because they're dedicated to God's word. And they are engaged, not just knowing about Jesus. They're engaged in the cause of Christ. In the furthering of the gospel. His kingdom work is a part of their daily life. And because, because they have those pieces uh, of the puzzle put together, they're able to overcome the evil one instead of being overcome by the evil one. And then spiritual fathers. Spiritual fathers are those who've known the Lord long enough that they're they're getting to know his character. They know he is eternal. He is the one who is from the beginning. And he's more than just a faraway God in heaven. But they're walking in a a day-to-day close relationship with him. And it's different than you have with the spiritual children or the spiritual young men. It's a different level of maturity. That's how God measures spiritual growth. You come to Christ, you grow, and you serve, and then you become to know God, come to know God as you know a friend. Life is about growth. Spiritual life is about spiritual growth. Here's what the Bible says in Colossians 2. Therefore, Paul's challenging the people in Colossae, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, So walk in him, rooted, that's a key word in this verse, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. This is a a tree illustration. I remember Easter, just a couple of years ago, we had this beautiful, beautiful tree in our front yard. It was big and it was full and provided a lot of shade to one side of our yard. We, we love that tree. And I don't know if, how many of you remember this Easter Sunday that this storm came through during the second of our three Easter services. And I got a call from a neighbor that said, you might want to come look at your tree. And so I remember going home, uh, running home Easter, and, and that tree, it had three big, this is, this is a tree, a tree. Three big branches coming off, and the three of them just went. And when I looked at the middle of it, it was all black on the inside. That the middle of that tree wasn't healthy at all. It looked great on the outside, but the core of that tree wasn't healthy, and it came all to pieces. And of course, it was Easter Sunday after I'd preached three sermons, so there's nothing that brings you greater joy than pulling these giant limbs out of my neighbor's uh, driveway, which he did appreciate on Easter. However, It didn't do me much good. Here's what happens. Trees grow until the day they die. And humans do too. Only sometimes, like that tree that was in my front yard, some of us start dying on the inside before we start showing signs of dying on the outside. How can you tell if someone's dying on the inside? Three three things. that, That things are getting to be rotten on the inside. And these are these are measurables. You, you notice they stop learning, they stop maturing, and stop caring. So here's the first one. You can tell a person has stopped learning because they just don't ever share anything new. Uh, you, you talk about their spiritual life and they tell you a story from 25 years ago. They, they tell you a hero story from way back when. But there's not a, here's what God's doing in my life this week. Here's where God's moving in me today. Here, here's something that in my, in my Bible reading, something I, a podcast I was listening to, a sermon, a Bible study I'm a part of, here's where God stirred something in me that had not been stirred before. I'm learning new things. When you stop having those conversations, there's some problems on the inside. You can tell when a person has stopped maturing because, because character hasn't changed. That you think about this, you're not becoming more thoughtful, you're not becoming more patient. Uh, you, you, you don't do anything that's more helpful around the house or more impactful on your neighbors or at work or at church. In fact, you, you look and you say, well, years ago, let me tell you all the things I was doing, the steps I was taking, the character that was developing in me. But, but there's not been anything like that for a long time. In fact, instead of taking ground and growing, you've actually retreated. You know, a lot of people, man, I was, boy, I got in this college ministry, and we were doing and going and blowing. But then, then it all just started drying up from there, and 
There aren't big steps being taken anymore. Where, where, where is the growth? Well, there's something that's getting rotten on the inside. You can tell when a person has stopped caring. This is a big theological statement. You probably want to write this down. You can tell when a person has stopped caring because they don't care. They just don't care. Uh, they don't care any more deeply today about children starving in the world or justice in the world or the lostness of people in the world. In fact, maybe they built some, some layers of insulation so that they don't feel an obligation to care about that anymore. But when you stop caring deeply and you stop being burdened by things like that, there's something that, that's a marker in your heart that something's dying in there. God never intends for us to stop growing. So, now we're to the outline. Those of you who are concerned and not sure what had happened to the outline. Life's about growing. Birds grow, bees grow, plants grow, trees grow. I made that to rhyme on purpose because I started feeling Dr. Susie after I started. Everything that's living is growing, and over the past few years, because of the pace of change in our world, you've learned that you need to grow just to keep up. You need to grow just to stay up with what's happening in the world. If you're not growing in your workplace, you're not taking on new technology, and you're not, you're not keeping up to date on what is current, you're going to become non, non, or irrelevant to your workplace before long if you're not keeping up, you're not staying up with things. If, uh, oh my goodness, how many of you downloaded the new iPhone uh, thing this week? I'm still trying to figure out how to use my phone again now. I had it pretty well figured out, but, but you have to keep on developing, keep on growing, keep on learning, or else you, you find yourself way behind and, and out of the loop. Life's about growing, and we ought to be getting better till the day we die. Now, Last week we looked at Romans 12. Paul writes, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all He's done for you. Let them be a living, holy sacrifice, the kind He'll find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship Him. Then in the next verse, Romans 12, 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. The renewing, because it's a present active tense. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Life is about growing and growing is about transformation. And it, it's about moving from something we're not to something we should be. That's what growth is. I want to I stop before I hit uh, point number two. This is a good transition spot. Uh, we have a video testimony for you. My name is Gerald, and this is my story. Raised in a Christian home with Christian family. Aunts, uncles, cousins, everyone I knew was a Christian in Linden, Alabama. We all attended church, prayed, served, were baptized, and loved each other. I was saved, baptized in 1946. Until February 8, 1988, no one knew that I was a follower of Christ. Oh, I attended church on Sundays, participated in the Wednesday events, was a member of most committees, and taught Sunday school, and generally thought I was a Christian. Spent 27 years as a Presbyterian, then 27 years as a Methodist. My life on Sundays and Wednesdays was much different than on the other days when I was at work or at play. I was a great showman, salesman, demonstrating my wonderful faith to the world and living my selfish and self-centered life to the fullest when not attending Christian events. My job required much travel and much entertaining of customers. Expense accounts covered the expenses and allowed me to indulge my alcoholic passion. I was a drunk. Alcoholic was not my style. I was just a drunk. No AA for me. Well, the Lord worked on me for some time. He was very gentle and kind with me. He protected me in all those years and brought me to my knees one night in 1984. My pastor and a selected group of men met every Tuesday night this night, as I joined the group late, I had been drinking since noon with my boss, I asked the group to place their hands on me and to pray for me to stop drinking. They did so, and as they prayed, the Lord dropped me to my knees. I was released from alcohol. It took until December 31 of 1984 for me to stop drinking, but I had been dry ever since. 
So from December 31, 1984 until February 8, 1988, what happened? I transitioned from drunk to a follower of Christ. I stopped smoking in March of 1985. Developed a relationship with pastors, rediscovered my family, just changed. In the fall of 1987, I became discouraged in the direction the United Methodist Church was traveling, so I left the church. In January 1988, my employer decided that my services were no longer needed. So there I am with no church and no job. What now? In our backyard was a large fruitless mulberry tree that I used as a prayer tree. Early morning, February 8, 1988, I was hanging onto that tree and praying hard for help. I didn't hear a voice, but I heard a message. Jerry, I've taken your church from you and now your job. What else do you need to lose to decide to turn to me? My answer was, nothing, Lord. I want to turn to you now. That was a moment my life changed. I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I was. Praise God. I would like to tell you that I'm a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, but I can't do that. I can tell you that I try to be the best follower of Christ I can be. I can tell you that my life now is to serve Jesus through serving others as best as I can. I know that Jesus loves me, and that I love Jesus. I know that I am forgiven. I know that I have eternal life with the Lord God Almighty. I know every day is a struggle just to get through life. I know that the one who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. I know my life is still to serve the Lord all day every day because I'm still here on earth. If you haven't accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, Let me take this opportunity to ask you not to waste any more time to ask Jesus into your heart. God bless you and all of your family. I appreciated uh, Jerry's testimony so much when I saw it a few days ago because it's about a journey. It's not... And, and now I have arrived and everything's settled and everything's going to keep rolling from here. But it's, it's a journey and there are steps and sometimes there are challenges that make those steps hard. But you keep pressing forward and you're never done growing. Life is about transformation. So what is it that we should be when, when we're all grown up? And one of the things, and Jerry, Jerry covered this really well, we're never all grown up. It's a process. We are to be conformed to the image of God's Son. And then and that's uh, from, from Romans 8, Romans 12, we're supposed to be transformed. Now, to be transformed is to have our form changed. It's that word from which we get our word metamorphosis. It's, it's a caterpillar going to a butterfly. It's that, that sort of dramatic transformation to be conformed to the image of his sons to be to become like another to be changed to the form of another with another the goal of our growth is to conform to the shape of God's son to think like him to act like Jesus so what is Jesus like he's always on a mission As we follow him through the scriptures, he's always on a mission. And his thought process is so different than most of us. And what is important is so different than most of us. He acted like a servant of all. He was sent from God. And that's what growing looks like. You're on a mission. When you grow as a football player, you, from from the youngest levels of football on up into the professional ranks, hopefully you're, you're learning to be faster to read defenses better, to block better, to tackle better, whatever your role is on the team, you're getting better. And when you grow as a Christian, you learn to believe better, and you learn to hope better, and you learn to love better, and you're transformed by this renewing of your mind. You believe less of what the popular culture says, and you believe more of what God's Word says. You become less of a taker, and you become more of a giver, Life becomes less about you and more about other people. And as you, as you look at your life right now, would you say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm becoming less of a taker and more of a giver? Or would you say, no, I'm just, I'm riding it out where I've been for a very long time. There's not much different about me than has been for a long time. Now, none of this happens overnight. It's a process. 
It's an ongoing process. And that's why Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You're not just suddenly renewed. And, oh, it's all good, and I'm all better, and I'm never going to have to think about this again. It's every day. What, and, and your mind is where it starts. So what are you inputting? What you see, what you hear, what you read, what you're exposed to, the conversations in your life. All those things are going to feed into how your mind thinks And what happens in your mind results in what happens in your behaviors. Why don't you just turn to your neighbor and say, you need to be renewed. Yeah, and go ahead and tell them, and and I, I do too, yeah. You guys have such great enthusiasm for, for taking a shot at the people next to you. It's disturbing in all kinds of levels. Yeah, yeah, you need to be renewed, and Renewal is a process, and it happens a step at a time. But the more steps you take in the direction of Christ, the more progress you make. Our goal is to step up to spiritual growth by committing to taking a spiritual step, one next step at a time. And it all starts with renewing your mind. Now, throughout Christian history, there have been certain things, certain practices found in the Scriptures that believers have done. And if you do these practices in a consistent basis, the opportunity for your your mind to be pointed in the right direction, for your heart to be redirected, for your obedience to be consistent, they come into play. And these things lead to spiritual transformation. Now, we learned last week the most fundamental of these is weekly worship, just exposing yourself to the apostles' teaching, if nothing else, but then to gathering together with other believers so that you're reminded that this is the direction of this spiritual life. This is how this thing works. This is how God's designed the Christian life to work. And so weekly worship, to reset your spiritual clock, your mental uh, inclination toward Christ, to be reminded of what's really important. And again, the more distance you place, the more times you're not a part of that, the farther away you're going to find yourself from the Lord. The second most fundamental step is, is the Bible. And I know sometimes if you've been a Christian for a long time, you start thinking that, well, I've heard this before. This is not news that I should read the Bible. But see, the reality is you're not reading the Bible. Because if we were reading the Bible, what we're doing in the output of our life would be a lot different. So I'm going to keep saying this over and over again for a very long time, just so you know. I'll warn you ahead of time. I'm going to keep pushing you toward God's Word because at all those different stages we talked about in 1 John, the different stages of spiritual growth, in those stages from the spiritual children, the spiritual young men, the spiritual elders, the thing that keeps growing all those different stages is the Bible. It's the most consistent source of spiritual growth. So we're going to push you toward the Bible always. And the Bible contains truth. It's not the National Enquirer. It's not what you hear on CNN. It's not what you hear on Fox News. This is not partial truth. This is God's truth. And it's consistent. And it's powerful. It's not a distortion of the truth. Everything, God says, everything the Bible says about God is true. Everything the Bible says about life is true. Everything the Bible says about you is true. That's the nature of God's Word. So when you read this book... It's going to help you to think more accurately about about the world, more precisely understand God's will for your life, and and the more accurate and precise and clear your thinking is, the more mature you're going to be. And you're going to have to get that from the thought that has reflected the mind of Christ, the mind of our God in this book. So there are many more steps you can take as you mature. Prayer is a big part of this. And again, well, I know I should pray. Well, that's different than praying. And we have substituted knowledge about what we should do for doing something. It's so many different levels. When uh, Next week, we're going to talk about uh, uh, everything we have, everything we are comes from God. And to learn to be generous. Well, you know you should. But that's different than doing something with that. But that is a step that will help to encourage you in the right direction. Being a part of a group where you're going through life with a group of people who really do know you, know your heart, and you know them, and you're taking care of them, and they're taking care of you, to to share your faith with other people, because that grounds you in the Word, and it focuses your heart in a completely different way in relationship to the things of God. And these are just the things that we're talking about during these five weeks. These are the steps. These are these core devotions. Your challenge this week is to grow. 
in the 30-day church challenge book. I hope that you've, you've read your chapter that relates to these themes of spiritual growth. And it's just small, simple steps each day. There's a challenge there every day. And here it's spend time with God. That you're going to spend a little bit of time reading the Bible. And you're going to spend a little time talking to God about what he said in the Bible. And talking to him about your life and what you need. Now, if you're new to reading the Bible. Your challenge for this week. And and really for a lot of people. Well, I've read the Bible. But consistently, every day reading the Bible. I want five minutes. How about that? Five minutes. Would you read the Bible? Say, I'm going to read the Bible for five minutes, and then I'm going to talk to God about what I read for two minutes. I'm going to do seven minutes a day, because seven is such a good spiritual number in the Bible. Five minutes to read the Bible, two minutes to talk to God about what I read in the Bible. And set a, set a timer. You think, well, I've been reading forever. And then you, you look at your timer. No, I've been reading for 15 seconds. I'm going to pray, and you pray, and you think of everything you can pray for, and you're praying, 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 and then you realize, I've been praying for 45 seconds. Five minutes in the Bible, two minutes in prayer, talking to God about the things that you've been reading in the Bible. Five minutes a day. And, and just, just start this. If, uh, if you're a beginning Bible reader, I want to encourage you in this uh, we have a church-wide Bible reading plan. We're in the Old Testament now, and that might not be the best place for you to jump in if you have never read before. It's, it's core foundational stuff. We're reading in Genesis most of last week and this week. But, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But start in Luke. How about that? Read in Luke, and then go right on to John. Because if you read Luke and John, you will be reading most of the core stories about Jesus. What he taught and what he did. And then just keep going from there and set your timer. Five minutes. You're not going to read through the whole Bible in the next week. But you're going to get a good dose of Jesus and about God's will and God's ways. And that's a simple challenge. And there are all kinds of ways to do this. But when, when I challenge you, five minutes reading the Bible, two minutes in prayer. Here's why. Because most people just aren't up to more than that because you get discouraged. Yesterday, yesterday, as is my habit, on Saturday mornings, I go to the gym at 7 o'clock, because that's when it opens. And I jumped on an elliptical, and I throw my sermon up there, and I do two of my run-throughs on Saturday morning. Preaching this sermon, I'm very intense when I'm on the elliptical. That's why, that's why all the things that happen in the service, in and out and up and down and notes passed and all the things that happen in the phone's going off and that doesn't bother me because I'm, I'm listening to really loud music and working, stressing myself on this machine at the same time as I'm working on the sermon. So you're not going to phase me too much. And uh, I glance up and there's a guy, he's a big guy. I'm looking at him, I think that, that guy, he, he, you can tell he's, Kind of an athletic sort of character. He's a he's the kind of guy that could have certainly played football in high school. He he's a big guy. He could have played football in college, maybe. But that was a lot of years ago. And he came to the gym yesterday morning, at seven o'clock, same time I did. He was going to get back in college football playing for him one day. And. He, he threw himself into that, and he is working. Now, he won't be back tomorrow. He'll, he'll be in traction tomo- today and tomorrow. He, he, he was going to catch up on everything that he had been in a day. And when it comes to spiritual things, I wish it worked that way. I wish that you could just jump in, and I'm going to read the whole New Testament today, and suddenly I'm going to be all spiritual, and I'll be... Like Billy Graham uh, today. Well, it took, you, it took that guy a while to get in the shape he's in. It's going to take him a while to dig back out of that. And when it comes to spiritual things, it took you a while to get in the spiritual shape you're in. It's going to take you a while to get back to where God wants you to be. And so, ease into it. Just start. Just take a step. Five minutes of reading. 
And then you come to something that, that strikes you, stop and pray about that. This last week, I'm reading in Genesis, I'm reading about uh, Abraham. Abraham, uh, chap- it's Genesis chapter 12, a- God says, Abraham, you, I want you to move from where you are, and I want you to go to where I want you to be. Just start walking. And the things that God does, and Abraham just says, like the kids, he just says, okay. You said follow. I'm following. I'm walking. I'm going. And the faith just really touched me as I read that story in Genesis 12. And so that's what I prayed about. God, forgive me for not, for not moving when you say move, going when you say go. And, and God, help me to have faith like that. It's an example to follow uh, that, that I read. And so I, that's what I talked to God about that day. As I was reading through my Bible, I stopped because I felt God talking to me about something that I needed to work on more. That I would have a greater faith that He's not going to lead me in the wrong direction. I'm going to trust Him in everything. So that's, that's what we're talking about. Read the Bible. Spend a couple of minutes in prayer. God, make me more like that. If you come to a place that causes you to want to do something. Okay, here's a tangible something. In the, the devotional reading, there's a, there was a spot. You need, in the community section, there were some things about specific tasks related to people. Same thing when you get to the part about outreach, the last week that we're going to be sharing together in the Be the Church Challenge. And there were specific things. This, okay, I, I have to make a phone call. I need to send an email. I need to make a visit. I need to reach out to somebody. I need to do something tangible. And those things, I have to write those things down. So that's, that's what it looks like to interact with what God has said. Now, one more thing. What's the purpose of growth? The purpose of growth is reproduction. John said the highest form of spiritual maturity to be a spiritual father. Your father, that means you have children. So there's a reproduction factor that comes into this spiritually. A mature tree produces fruit that produces another tree. A mature rabbit produces, mature, produces rabbits. A, a mature banana slug, you didn't see that coming, did you? Produces banana slugs, I assume. John 15. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in them, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples. We are born to reproduce. And this thing of being a disciple, a lot of people claim it, but there are measurables. There, th- this is not a, oh, I think I'm all good. That's not how it's met. God has declared measurement, and a part of this is reproduction. Jesus calls it bearing fruit, and we are born to reproduce. Bearing fruit. And he says, you can only bear fruit if you remain in him. Back in First part of February, we have a peach tree in our backyard, and it had all kinds of weird limbs coming off of it, and I cut off one of the largest limbs because it was, it was doing its own thing way out here to the side, and that's not going to be good. And I cut it off, and I took it inside, and I kept it in our living room because I was going to harvest my peaches from the living room, right? Isn't that how it works? No, come to find out, that branch died when it was disconnected from the rest of that peach tree. Well, he says, you... You're a branch from Him, and if you're not connected, abiding, remaining in Him, you can't bear fruit. Now, Jesus, Jesus is the ultimate fruit bearer. The way you abide, we see it in Jesus. He spent clearly so much time in the Word because He quotes it freely, teaches it daily, connected to the Word connected to God in prayer, just those two basic things, and he's abiding. And when you start abiding, you start bearing fruit. Jesus was the ultimate fruit bearer, and every one of us comes in this line because Jesus reached out to those followers, follow me, and they did. 
And they gave their lives to him. And then those guys told some other people. And those people told someone else. And finally it got around until somebody told me. And that's how the fruit is multiplied. And that's how it keeps moving forward. And we'll talk about that in more depth here in a couple of weeks. Picture this for a moment in your mind. Uh, I don't know if the guy yesterday felt this or not. But maybe he woke up yesterday morning. And he said, he looked in the mirror and said, how did I get here? When did this happen? How many, how many five-gallon buckets of ice cream have I eaten to arrive at this physical state? And, and I need to do something about this. And he just didn't want to be that out of shape anymore. And, and then you picture your body where, okay, I'm, I'm not in good shape. And then you picture your body where... I'm, I'm in good shape. People say, hey, you look like you've been working out. Uh, and, and they don't just say that because you're on crutches, because you've hurt yourself working out, but because y- you're healthier. Now transfer that to the spiritual realm. Imagine yourself. Hey, you don't care how much about God. You're not that interested in people. You know, basic character qualities. You're self-centered. You're lazy, and you don't value you telling the truth, and you don't keep your word. You don't help other people. And then picture yourself just a spiritual giant. And you're trustworthy. And you're other-centered. And people admire you for your character because you tell the truth. And they say, I want to be like you when I grow up spiritually. You're patient with your kids. You're self-controlled. You enjoy helping others. And which feels better, spiritually flabby or spiritually fit? And you can become that person. And to get there, you take, it's one day at a time, one step at a time, but you're going to have to step somewhere because it doesn't happen just because. You can become like Jesus, like he was here on earth, living that life, sharing those values, seeing the world through that lens. To be that way, you'll need to think that way. And that's why Paul says, transform by the renewing of your mind. So, Spend seven minutes a day, some time in the Word, some time in prayer. And some of you, you're already really consistent at a level like that. So you probably need to, maybe you go to ten minutes uh, in, in the Word. And maybe, maybe five minutes in prayer. But you take a step beyond where you are now is, is what we, we want you to hear to grow. Because it's going to take more you get on a weight machine at the gym and you're going at five pounds, that may be good if you hadn't been exercising in a while, but then you're going to have to increase that if you're going to keep getting stronger and keep getting better and keep getting healthier. And same thing in spiritual things, to add to your disciplines, to strengthen your spiritual fitness for God. But do you do this for 30 days or for the next 21 and you're on the road to spiritual health? Spiritual growth. Now, it's all a matter of choosing. Tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock, that gym opens again. And you know, I hope that guy who felt like I need to do something, I hope he, I hope he gets up and he comes. And he takes another day and another step. And, and I hope that when you wake up in the morning... That you'll, you'll open God's Word, and you'll read for five minutes, and you'll spend a couple of minutes in prayer talking to God about what you read, and then other things that are going on in your life that you need to talk to Him about. And maybe, just maybe, you've taken a pretty good step toward Jesus.